Welcome back, gents, as we prepare to kick off session two. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the organising team for this gathering have all been blown away by the gents who have put their hand up to be part of this from near and far. We've got some fellows over in New Zealand from Wellington and Christchurch, so chuffed to have you all on board. But get this, we also have some bold warriors of the faith from Africa. Yep, I said Africa. To our brothers in Uganda and in Kenya, we are so humbled that you've joined us to journey with us, to join in him with us and to that other wonderful, wonderful nation that has a contingent of men joining us too. They are very welcome. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue. Sorry, this is very unprofessional of me. Underneath Victoria. No, the one above, above Antarctica and underneath Victoria. That's it. Tasmania. Really, really pleased to have the guys from Tasmania. Six locations right around the Archdiocese of Hobart, Ulverston, Launceston. Hi to you all. You're really, really welcome. Now, don't turn it off. We know you exist. I can't be expected to know all of the little countries of the world, especially the, the smaller ones. Oh, man, I thought the Queenslanders got upset about losing origin. Let's just all calm down. We know where, what is it? Tasmania. We know where Tasmania is. Everyone's welcome especially the Queenslanders. Big Green, our good state of origin. <laughs> right, okay, let's get on with it, I hear you. Well, I'm on it. You're about to hear from a man named Peter Shikovsky. I've met Peter a few times, he has an amazing presence. Some people just command your attention, not because they're bunging it on or demanding it, no, just because they're authentic. He says it as it is. He doesn't pull punches, he loves hard, thinks much, is obviously prayerful and has freedom in who he is in Jesus and that gives him the ability to speak with great wisdom and clarity. Add to that, he's got a great voice and that doesn't mean I'm saying he's got a good head for radio. No, he just does have an awesome voice. He could have played Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings or something. Yes, New Zealand guys, we know that that was made over there, good for you. So Peter we will, is going to speak to us uh, and, and then be followed by some more worship from Tim and Stephen Kirk and the Disciples of Jesus Canberra community. Again, I'd reiterate the importance of ensuring that you are following the laws and guidelines of your jurisdiction and that your bishops, what the, the guidelines your bishops have given you regarding COVID-19 safety for the sake of the vulnerable wherever you are. It may mean you can sing, and if you can, then have a crack. Sing well and loud for all of us who are at this time unable, but who wish we could. If, like me, you're not able to sing in gatherings due to COVID-19, then take the opportunity again to listen with the ear of your heart. Be ministered to by what you hear in the music, in the singing, and surrender to God's voice. After that, we'll have the privilege of listening into a conversation between Bishop Michael Kennedy and John Hanrahan before we have the chance to have our own conversations uh, about Peter Shikovsky's input. So now, back to Peter. As I was saying, he's an amazing guy, accomplished, clever, wise. He was a senior manager for a large telecommunications business in design planning and management. He was an Australian national network design manager with an interstate staff of 380 technical and professional designers. He's married with five adult sons and 11 grandchildren. He has, throughout all his time, pursued a lifelong interest as a committed Catholic in making the Christian gospel relevant in contemporary society. He has a graduate diploma in ministry from St Paul's Theological College in Brisbane and completed a Master's in Theology in 2011 at ACU. He has a keen interest in Ignatian spirituality and is an experienced giver of the exercises. He's the co-founder of Men Alive, which has given 420 retreats, probably more by now, to more than 30,000 men since its beginnings. And, and that includes parishes in every state of Australia and New Zealand. One of Men Alive's goals is to wake the sleeping giant, the lady of the church. Another focus of his work is fathers and, and their teenage sons and young men aged 15 to 30. He retired at the age of 57, obviously so he could dedicate himself more fully to this amazing, transforming work. 
Peter Shikovsky is a guy I want to be like, and so should you. Today he's going to talk about what is needed. You might want to take notes. I'm going to. Thanks, Jude. It's great to be with you and men all around Australia in New Zealand. What is needed is our topic. What is needed in this storm we find ourselves in, so beautifully represented by Rembrandt's painting in the flyer you've all seen. For me as a baby boomer, uh, the churches in a storm I describe in this fashion. I grew up in the 50s and 60s at a parish called Bayswater in Western Australia where 70% attendance was the norm. The church I attended was a well-accepted, normal, substantial part of the society. Today, when I attend my parish, attendance is 10%. Most young people don't come. The sexual abuse scandal in the recent years has hit us hard, uh, troubled us in, in, turn, in, in our internal credibility and our external credibility, and now we have a COVID crisis, which has hit this big pause button on our lives. And I live in a profoundly secular, postmodern world. If we go back to the image of Jesus with the disciples on the lake, he begins to tell us what to do. So let's go into the picture. Professional fishermen nearly drowning on a sea they know well. Violent storms uh, regularly happen. They've probably seen their mates drown. Some of them. So, very understandably, it's getting too critical. They go down the back, they find Jesus and they wake him. He wakes up and he says to them, O ye of little faith, O ye of little faith, why are you so terrified? And then he calms. And the, the text says this incredible hush falls over the whole scene. Everything stills. And, they, and the disciples say, who is this? Who is this? It was a reasonable question from seasoned sailors. Um, but Jesus takes them to a different place. He takes them to a bigger captain, a bigger storm, a bigger, a bigger journey. Um, I bet you he says to them somewhere later, you woke me up, but in this circumstance, I think I woke you up. I think I woke you up. And you began to see what this journey will entail. So I think there's the first clue that Jesus and the scriptures gives us. This is an hour for us to go down the back of the boat, shake Jesus, shake the Messiah, the Son of God, and, and ask him what to do. Let him wake us up. There's this beautiful quote from Mother Teresa, which I've been sitting with all week. She said, you only discover Jesus is all you need when Jesus is all that you have. Second part to, uh, to the answer for me uh, in considering this question is in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, where one of the scribes who's asking our question, what's the heart of the matter, Lord, comes forward and he says, which is the first of the commandments? Jesus replies, the first is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and the second, your neighbour as yourself. There is no greater commandment than all of these. And the scribe gets it. He's an honest and intelligent and prayerful man. Clearly, he says to him, Well said, teacher, you are right in saying, He is one and there's no other than he, and to love him with all your understanding, with all your strength, uh, with all your heart and to love your neighbour as yourself. That's the heart of the matter. I get it, he says. Je when, when Jesus saw that he answered with understanding, he says to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared ask him any more questions. Let me say this. Jesus sa doesn't say, believe in God. He doesn't say, keep the commandments. He doesn't even say, love God. He says, love God with all your being, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your understanding and all your strength. 
He calls for an uncompromised and unconditional falling in love with God. Wholehearted, all-encompassing of our life and energy. So is this for real? Or do we just subcontract that to those we call saints? Can I say, Christianity is not like golf. What do I mean by that? I know me, who's played six games of golf in his life. I'm a terrible golfer. I've got mates who are good social golfers once a week, have a great time on a golf course. And I know of the golfing pros, the Tiger Woods and the Jason Days, who live, eat, breathe, uh, drink golf and make millions of dollars uh, a year in earnings. It's their life. It's their absolute passion. It's what makes them tick. Can I say Jesus' proposition is probably something like, in, in, in the golfing analogy terms, we're all born pros, gifted and called to fall in love with God. We're gifted and called from the least of us to the greatest of us, if we want to use those words, to do precisely that, to be uh, someone who loves God with all their heart and their soul and their mind. And Christian history for 2,000 years tells us that wherever individuals and groups respond to this greatest commandment in this fashion, they're transformed. They transform the church, people flock to them, and society is impacted. When, his, when Jesus' followers look like him and love like him, the kingdom, the church, flourishes. So there's the invitation, the second part of the solution. What's on offer? Let's remind us what is really on offer. What has Jesus really said uh, is on offer from the kingdom? He's revealed to us that we're held in existence by a loving Father who's created us. My next breath, every action I take in my life, is a gift from him. The theologians and saints say if he looked away for, for three seconds, we'd all disappear. Everything is still being created and gifted to us each moment of the day by a loving God. And this loving God is a father, like the prodigal father and with the prodigal sons, who's constantly looking for us, seeking to draw us, to love us, to woo us. He's inviting us home. He's wanting to repair our disrepair. He's wanting to establish this intimacy, this love. I was at university in 1970, so 20 years into uh, this epoch that I've described, this epoch of the storm, with uh, graduates from high, Catholic high schools all, all around Western Australia. And for the first year, I watched them stop mass attendance of a Sunday. They just exited in a, in a year. Um, there was only a handful of us left. In the second year, someone came to me and invited me to consider making Jesus the centre, not a centre, the centre of my life. And I had the grace to say yes, and everything changed. Let me tell you what I discovered in the next 50 years uh, about that journey. I discovered that the greatest life coach I could ever have is always available, he's always and everywhere, to quote our Archbishop. He's, he comes for free, without charge, and he loves me without change or shadow. It doesn't matter how seriously I stray or get distracted. He cut, he's in attendance and he always picks up the phone. The contract is the great commandment. What establishes this relationship is the great commandment. I have got to fall in love. That's uh, the, the great commandment. And that love is an encounter. The famous theologian Karana said of the current era, Christians will either be mystics well, there won't be Christians at all. What did he mean? I think he meant that in the current climate, in the current society in which we live, either you will be someone that knows God with your head and your heart, and you have an encounter, or you'll really struggle, and intellectual Christianity will not suffice. The second thing I learned was, or the third thing I learned, the coach falling in love, the third thing I learned, only I can sign me up. I can't subcontract uh, this move in my life and this relationship in my life. Seven sacraments and 2,864 articles in the Catechism are really important, but they don't substitute for a relationship. 
we can't pin our souls to the back of a small group of social golfers or even a small church congregation. We have to pin our souls to the back of God. He's the only one big enough. We're created uh, only, only for him uh, to do that job. Finally, um, it's absolutely non-negotiable that I have the honesty and the humility uh, to tell it like it is. This father sees everything. Um, and it's on, uh, absolutely non-negotiable that I develop this relationship, not park it. Not park it. Um, imagine if I tried to park my marriage, I'm 43 years, mostly happily married, for, into a slot of one hour of a Sunday. Now, I'd be a dead man in two weeks. It just, it's not doable. Every re decent relationship we know requires effort, depthing, and investment. Uh, why would we think that God is any different? So each day must and can, can and must, contain conversations with God about the, and, and the experiences of his help, this interaction. We need his comfort in the adventures of life. And this is what becoming a disciple means. In our session number four in, in this conference, Robert Falzon will talk about how do you do that in practice? So we're not going to go there today, but it's really important that we get the how-tos. What's the alternative? You can go it alone. Or you can try to make it work in one hour of a Sunday. And as I've said, that's not realistic. We know that's not going to work. The great adventure of life needs the great captain. We know that the quiet, soft and comfortable life is just a myth. And God's offer is that he'll mysteriously sustain us in everything. Uh, the good, the bad and the ugly. And, and we know that uh, serious drama is a normal part of life. God, God doesn't take that away, but he mysteriously will sustain us in everything. We only need to change our vision of our Christianity, make a new beginning and ask God to show us how. The storm invites us to reconsider this question. G.K. Chesterton said in his essay, What's Wrong with the World? The Christian ideal has been tried, has not been tried and found wanting. It's been tried and found difficult and then left untried. It's difficult because we love so many other things uh, than we, than, uh, more than we love God. And so over those 50 years, God has taught me uh, slowly and carefully uh, to put him more and more at the middle, to love him more deeply, uh, to follow him more nearly. James Finlay is a celebrated author and psychotherapist. He spent uh, eight years in the monastery with Thomas Merton. He tells this story about love. Um, it was an initiation process he found in his early practice in the clinic that treated alcoholics. So a new patient would arrive in the ward, he'd probably be put on a drip in a really bad way, he'd spent some time recovering, and then he'd be invited to attend his first AA meeting. He'd walk into a room um, with a large uh, circle of people in it, men who are uh, ongoing, working on their alcoholism, um, and no one would say anything uh, they'd sit in a silent circle and all these uh, men around the circle would have their eyes on the ground. Two chairs in the middle. Um, one man would be the host. He'd seat the new guy in um, and he'd ask him this question. What do you love more than anything in the world? The man would uh, typically say something like, my wife. And this circle of grim-faced men would, would, say, would say in unison in response, bullshit. The question would come back again. What do you love more than anything in the world? My kids, the circle of men again, would say, bullshit. What do you love more than anything in the world? My job, my profession. Bullshit, the room would roar the third time. Eventually, the man would... Um, would hear the question and, and come to the truth. What do you love more than anything else in the world? The booze. Uh, the room would erupt with smiles. Uh, they'd stand and applaud him. 
they, they'd come and greet him one at a time and give him a hug and welcome him into their community of healing and journeying together. Great story of a moment of truth. James Finlay calls this an axial moment, a moment where destiny turns. What do you love more than anything else in the world? I'd like to finish with a quote from Father Pedro Arupe. He was a young priest in Hiroshima, living in the novitiate behind a small hill when the atom bomb went off and destroyed uh, so many people. Within hours, with his medical training, he was nursing broken, bleeding uh, Japanese people in their shattered chapel, roof gone, um, extraordinary suffering, hundreds of people. He said the experience marked him forever, changed him forever. Um, but this man went on to be the Superior General of the Jesuits um, for 18 years and is, is a remarkable post-Vatican uh, Vatican II and post-Vatican II figure. He says this to us, um, and let's read this carefully. Um, you'll see it in front of you. He says, Nothing is more practical than finding God. Nothing is more practical. Nothing is more practical than falling in love in a quite absolute and final way. What you are in love with, Pedro Rupe says, what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, what you, how you spend your weekends. It will decide what you read. It will decide whom you know. It will decide what breaks your heart. And it will decide, decide what amazes you with joy and gratitude. And this closing line is, fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. So here's the invitation for us to close. Let's go to the back of the boat again. Shake Jesus by the shoulder. Let him wake us up. Fall in love with him and allow the new captain coach to take us on his, on his journey and his adventure to renew the church and change the world. Uh, he will gift us back our lives and then he'll give us, give us back uh, a renewed church and world if we, like many others before us, men and women, have the courage to say yes. Thank you, Peter. Beautiful. So it is about meeting Jesus, encountering Jesus. Simple as that. Let's sing a beautiful song. Good, good Father. Thank you, Lord.
You're a good, good father. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I. Am.
song do not fear written by my brother Stephen to God or you feel forsaken come to God the lowly and the poor of heart our God can lift you up for the Lord is father to the orphan and a mother holding children to her heart Our God can lift us up So do not fear for the Lord our God is with us Do not fear for he has conquered the night do not fear, for he carries us with the mercy and might. And we are not forsaken now. Come to God, all you've wandered far now. Come to God, all you've lost your way in life. God can lift you up For the Lord eternal is our refuge Underneath us are the everlasting is with us. Do not fear for he has conquered the night. Do not fear for he carries us with mercy and power. And we are not forsaken. Do not fear for his love is everlasting. Do not fear for his do not fear, for His mercies are renewed every fall, and we are not forsaken now. No, we are not forsaken now. Thank you, Jesus, for the power of your love. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and tenderness towards us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence right now, wherever we are around this country, that you're moving within us.
moving us to faith, moving us to repentance, moving us to encounter Jesus, the risen Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful time we've got together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, brothers. Now let's hear from Bishop Michael Kennedy and John Hanrahan. Well, saw you there writing a lot of notes like me, John, so you must have got a lot out of that as, uh, like me. Plenty there, wasn't there? Much to think about. Yeah, I think uh, so. I think I, there were some great quotes in there from Peter. Like, um, I loved how he said, you know, he was quite, he said, tell it how it is with honesty and humility. And even with his marriage, he said, I mean, how honest was that? Peter says, mostly happy marriage. I mean, I love that. <laughs> so, yeah. Mostly happy. You're doing pretty well in life if you're mostly happy. Yeah, I think that's aren't you? exactly. Yeah, yeah. That never I remember. Ma- I remember Mum saying <clears throat> to me, "Every life is difficult. You know, you can't be you can't be on top of the world all the time." You know, it was just a great talk from Peter. Um, just some of those those, I think some of the quotes he put in there. You know, from Pedro, the guy in Hiroshima, um, and also that Mother Teresa quote. I love that. You only discover Jesus is all you need when Jesus. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, um, you know, I've I've got storms around around my ministry mm-hmm. um, uh, about which basically are storms around following Jesus and and, and, and doing His will. Mm-hmm. Uh, but family people, you've got those storms as well. If you're seriously trying to be a disciple of Jesus, and you've got the storms in your family life too, yeah. as well. Of course, and we all battle with the storms in the in in society too, don't we? Yeah. Um, in a storm, go to Jesus. Yeah. It's amazing how often I realise after weathering a storm myself for some time, it hits me. Oh, no wonder I'm getting so down. Mm-hmm. I haven't taken this storm to Jesus yet. I haven't gone to him and said, I'm dealing with this. Yeah. I need, I, you know, I need you. Yeah. And, and as you say, Jesus mm. is there the whole time. He's just waiting for us. Yeah. Yeah. And in those and those times too, I do feel alone. Um, and, and that quote from Mother Teresa does um, stand out for me. You only discover Jesus is all you need when Jesus is all you have. And at those times, sometimes it does feel like Jesus is all you have. You know, so it did resonate with me. I think, you know, if I look at my life, there's been a lot of storms. Like everyone else, we've got storms in our life. I think, um, you know, for me, you know, losing the job, you know, I felt. Um, you know, there's feeling the worth, worthlessness, you know, I was embarrassed, um, you know, letting down my family. Um, you know, sick kids in hospital recently, um, the passing of close friends and relatives. Um, um, you yeah, know, especially when I lost the job, you know, it's like, you know, you, you just sort of strip naked, basically. You've got to be brought to your knees, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and the other thing Peter mentioned there too was, you know, he's talking about the storm in our society at the moment, and I do feel that. But I don't, I don't feel we're unique in that. I, I'm thinking, you know, previous generations probably have had their own storms, like the 60s with the sexual revolution. And, um, but the other thing too, I think we don't have to be too negative about it and that we can look at this storm as a bit of a positive and say, mm. well, look, here's, here's, your, here's your time to sort of, you know, stand up and be counted mm. and be tested. Mm. Um, and, and, and as you say, like a storm can be an opportunity, wasn't it? Like Peter said there. Mm-hmm. The apostles thought they were waking Jesus up, but Jesus is actually using the storm to wake them, to up. Wake them up and yeah. sort of shake them to their senses a bit, isn't he? I agree. So, yeah. 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 We, we, we need that shaking to our senses a bit. Yeah. Regularly. <laughs> that was Peter's f- first answer to, you know, the question, what's needed? And then the second one he went on to was, you know, the first commandment about, you know, loving God with all your heart, and all your mm-hmm. soul, and all your mind. So, and this, this takes me to one of the... One of the questions that the small groups have got after oh, is yeah. in, you know, what happens inside my head and heart when I hear the first and greatest commandment? And to me, you know, I've, I've thought about this and I, uh, you know, I do think more with my heart than my head. My IQ is higher than my EQ, but my, both don't. You know, my heart doesn't have a chance and they're both coming from a low space. But um, it so actually more makes... you more with your head, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm more of a head heart. person. Yeah. Um, so... To me, this this commandment actually makes me feel a bit despondent because you know I think it's a bit unreachable for me. Um, it also makes me feel a bit guilty um, because I think I can't do it, and also, oh, I'm not doing it. 
and also that it needs too much sacrifice. So I usually skip that one and go on to the other <laughs> commandments because they're a bit more straightforward and easy to understand. Start with the easy ones. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm not killing anyone. That's good, Tiff. That, that's interesting because I, my, mine's the same reaction to that mm. in that um, uh, I, I feel challenged when I, when I hear that that's the greatest commandment. Mm -hmm. Well, first I think, oh, can it really be that simple? Uh, like sometimes we overcomplicate things. Is it really that simple? And surely it is that simple because that's what Jesus told us. Yeah. Just love God and love your neighbour. So, but yet, even though it sounds so simple, I still feel very challenged by it. And I yeah. think it's because I feel guilty because I know, I feel anyway in my heart that I'm not, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not doing it as well as, as well as I could or as well as I should. Um, like Peter said there, uh, when Jesus' followers look like him and love like him, yeah. um, you know, great things happen. The world changes, the yeah. church is renewed. And so that's, that's what I feel the challenge. Yeah, I do love God and I do love my neighbour, but do I love them enough that I actually look like Jesus mm. and, and, and love like Jesus? So that is a, that yeah. is a, that is a real, real challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, I think, and uh, you know, I think we can be hard on ourselves with this one. Um, and I did mention it to a priest once, and he, he, he said to me, he said, St. Augustine said one time that our desire is God's desire. And, I mean, for me, my desire is basically, you know, try and get to heaven and, and you know, be happy or look for happiness. And I think, and that's, I think that's what we as Christians do, is that we have this longing for happiness, for justice, for truth, for, you know, getting to heaven. Um, so if that's our desire in our heart, and if, that's, if that desire is constant, that's leading us to Jesus. So that is our prayer. So I think through my work, through my marriage, um, through my, my relationships, that maybe I, maybe, you know, I am doing that, that maybe we don't need the big pendulum shift sort of stuff. Um, mm. And that, you know, so especially in my marriage where you have that, you know, every day it's, it's probably more small things that are challenges that you just need to, you know, they're the small crosses that we bear every day, um, you know, and, and putting others first that um, that we possibly are meeting this, this yeah. first commandment. Yes. Think about it when I'm not too hard on myself, mm. I do realise, well, yes, I do love God. I mean, I do love God more than anything else. Mm. Um, but, but I suppose he's got a few challenges. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so we just have to always be be aware of that, I suppose, but uh, but not be too down on ourselves when we realise perhaps our love is not perfect. Mm. But like Jesus calls us to to be perfect, but that doesn't happen in an instant. That happens yeah over a lifetime. You know, our our love just continually working on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when yeah, well, I was just going to say I felt the same. I mean, that was my thought. My first thought too, oh, okay, is it me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then you know, and I try and rationalise it in my head and think, um, you know, try and go away from me. But I'm sure it is a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but if you really loved yourself more than God and your wife and your mm -hmm. kids, and if I really love myself more than uh, than God and uh, and my family and my my parishioners. I wouldn't be getting out of bed and doing the things that I do every day, mm. and neither would you. Mm. But I, I, I think about okay, head. How do I love God with my head, mm -hmm. and how do I love God with my heart? Yeah. And uh, and I found myself, I uh, thinking thinking of my own dad, thinking of my father. Yeah. Um. And and he was a great man of principle. Um. And and so I think, yeah, the way to love with my head is by being a man of principle, mm. doing what I know is right. Yeah. Even if it's going to be tough, even whatever the consequences, you know, sticking to the your principles and what's right. That's loving mm -hmm. God with your head, not compromising on your principles. But then you also need the love of the heart, which Dad had too, which was his tenderness and compassion and his kindness to people. Yeah. Um, and I think if we love with one and not the other, mm -hmm. uh, well, well, I think we need to be loving God with both. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, and, a, and I think that's sort of what what we do need is a sense of you know, as men, we need to be courageous, hmm. um, and even though it may not be our comfort zone, we need to sort of stand up and be counted. I 
I know, you know, I've got a quote here that my son taught me, and uh, it was what he learnt when he was at Outward Bound. He said, a ship in harbour is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. And, and I love that. And so I think as, as men, we can't stay in the harbours. Um, you know, we've got to it's get nice out in the there. harbour. It is, it, and that's, you know, it's comfortable, and that's that comfortable life, right? Um, but, you know, and, and, I, and I think in one of the questions is a list of, you've got to put a, you know, a list down of what, um, of what you do in practice. And, you know, I put down a couple of things here, like in the last couple of years I found myself, you know, I'll be driving to work and hearing, hearing a politician on the radio talking about, you know, relaxing the abortion law in, in New South Wales, and I'd find myself pulling up and either texting ABC Radio or, or, or calling in. Because I'm thinking, well, you know, there's so you hear so much from the other side, and there's not that, you know, I don't know, there's not that sort of pushback a bit, and, and why not? Um, and so things like that, I think, um, you know, where I found myself challenged, you know, recently, you know, to do something, you know, yeah. practically. Yeah, that's probably a good one to finish on, actually, John. Is the the ship? Not being built for the safety of the harbour, harbour to, be, yeah, to, to, be, to get out there. Put, yeah, out, in, put out into the deep, into the Jesus deep, right, says, yeah. get out into the deep. Yeah. Good on you, John. Yeah. Thanks so much for your yeah. time with Thanks, today. Bishop. Good yeah, on you, God bless. Thank you. Thanks very much to Bishop Michael Kennedy and John Hanrahan for letting us look in on your conversation about the wonderful input from Peter Shikovsky. Now, I trust it gives you some great insights and starting points for your own conversations and musings now, either in groups or on your own. But again, before you break, move into groups or have a cuppa, feed the dog, whatever you're doing next in your local situation. Let's bring this session to prayer. Again, in unity as men, there's something really powerful when we do this that's going on consciously, expectantly, trusting in the promise that God will turn up in power and with impact for encounter, especially when we are doing what we're doing, gathering in his name. Last time we prayed, we did so sitting down, and this time, let's stand. Lose your stuff. Put down your phone. Put down your book, your pen, whatever you've got, your bagpipes, whatever you've got. And just stand. If you're a bit unsteady on your feet, that's okay. Grab a chair in front of you and close your eyes. So I'm going to be asking you to take on an ancient posture of prayer, signifying our openness to God. It's really simple and it's really profound again. And it says with our body what we're trying to say with our hearts. Jesus would have prayed like this. The apostles would have. You probably will in heaven. So, you know... Get used to it. Get settled and again, just be quiet for 10 seconds. Do this. Join me and your brothers in silence. Sure of who we are and confident in whose voice we are tuning into. Close your eyes and be deliberately still and quiet. And if you're in a hub and you need to pause to make that happen, again, do that now. And we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just ask you to stand with your palms raised, facing heaven, open to whatever God is going to give us. Lord, our brother Peter has spoken to our hearts. He has challenged us in this hour, to scramble down the back of the boat and wake the Messiah, all as the storm rages around us. Gentlemen, picture yourself reaching out and grabbing the arm of our Lord. Lord, awake. We need you. I need you. Our brother Peter Sikowski has asked us the question, 
What do we love more than anything else in this world? And you ask this of us, Lord, too. What do you love more than anything else in this world? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Jude? Do you love me, Robert? Do you love me, Andrew? Do you love me, you? Lord, as we come together again in prayer with the themes of Father Pedro Arupes, exhortation to fall in love, Lord, would those themes cause us again to fall in love with you? Gents, now as we pray, see if you can embrace these words and make them your own or move closer to making them your own. Ask for the desire to make them your own. And so with our palms facing upward, receiving, coming with nothing and waiting expectantly for what our Father wants to give us. We pray, Lord, I seek you. I desire to love you in an absolute final way. Lord, I want that love to seize my imagination and affect everything in my life. Lord, I want you to be the reason I get up in the morning. The reasons for all my doings in my day, my evenings, my weekend. May my love for you be the source of my joy and be a longing that breaks my heart for others. A love that overwhelms me with awe and gratitude. Lord, I want to fall in love with you, to remain steadfast in love with you and have that love as the source of my life. Lord, I make this prayer as perfectly as I can that I may truly, willingly, wholeheartedly desire this encounter with your love. A love that changes everything, that makes everything else pale by comparison. Lord, I trust in you. We as brothers trust in you and we commit to pray for each other. And we give you the glory as we say together, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, good men. How good is praying with other men? It quickens the soul and renews your spirit. I love it. It's time for a spill, or a break, or whatever you're going to do next. But when you come back, you're going to have a different face kicking off the next session. It is Deacon Peter Pelican making a second appearance and he's going to break open some scripture, lead us in prayer, then some worship, and then introduce the next two speakers. One of them is me, which is part of the reason Peter is doing the introduction, as the organisers were fearful that if I were to introduce myself, we could get very quickly into the realm of fiction. A bit like Lord of the Rings again, just not quite as long. Apparently I've got some form or something. I don't know. I just hope that Peter does a good job. Not for me, I don't really care, but, but I want him to do a really good job for Steve Lawrence because he and I are sharing the next session with two talks and Steve really deserves a good intro. 
So good luck, Peter Pelican. It's a big responsibility. Don't let us down, mate. A couple of good intros for Steve, not me. It's not a big deal for me, as I said. 20 minutes or so each, give or take five minutes. Just soften the crowd up a bit. And we'll see you all for session three, which is being referred to by many as the best session. Well, that's, that's what's what they're saying, whoever they are. But, but it will be good. Maybe not the intro part, but the talks will be fantastic. Don't forget, go to Facebook send your snaps through on the ACBC Facebook page as a comment. Keep them coming in. Hub organisers, try to sort that out for us if you can. Gents, we'll see you shortly. <laughs>